How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs on what's happening in the genetic world. During my broadcast, I educate you, the public, on genetic and health topics through event coverage, news stories, book movie reviews, and interviews. Guests include genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, patient advocates, and professors. I'm honored to introduce today's guest, Dr. Michael Fossil. He's the world's most foremost expert on the clinical use of telomerase for age-related diseases. In 1996, he wrote the first book on the telomerase theory of aging, reversing human aging, and has published the sole medical textbook on the topic. Most recently, he published The Telomerase Revolution, which was named one of the five best science books of the year by the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Fossil earned his PhD and MD from Stanford University, where he taught neurobiology and research methods. He has lectured at the National Institutes of Health and the Smithsonian Institution, and has appeared on Good Morning America, CNN, BBC, and NPR, among others. He's currently working to bring telomerase to human trials for Alzheimer's disease with his company, Telocyte. And he also has some roots in Connecticut, which was interesting to learn. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, girl. Nice to be here. Good morning to you. So let's start out, before we get into kind of all the, the details of this, of just kind of a broad view of what is the telomere theory of aging? Well, it's a misnomer, for one thing, um, because in some sense, telomeres are, are simply one piece of the whole puzzle. And I would love to call it the epigenetic theory of aging or any number of other things. Um, but uh, misnomers aside, what it basically says is that aging is not simply entropy. It has to do with a loss of maintenance, and that that's loss of maintenance is related to changes in telomere length and it's related to changes in gene expression, but the outcome is very practical, which is human age-related diseases. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that that as a theory is interesting, but to me the question isn't what's the theory show, it's does it have practical applications in medicine? Uh, and I think we'll get into that because I think it does. I've been arguing this in Journal American Medical Association and elsewhere for 20 years. And so for those that maybe don't know what a telomere is, what is your way of describing it for kind of non-science people? Well, it's, the, it's pretty easy to say that it's the end of your chromosomes. But more importantly, it's a piece at the end of the chromosomes that shortens over time. And that has implications for gene expression throughout the rest of the cell. And in what ways can telomerase then slow or maybe even reverse aging? Well, it, the first thing to, to remember is that aging is not a universal phenomenon. Um, you know, we tend to think of it that way because everybody we know ages, and dogs and cats and, you know, horses and cattle, and everything we think of birds, they age. But there are organisms that don't, and more specifically, there are parts of your body that don't. Example, uh, most of the people who are listening to this are several decades old, you know, two decades, six decades, whatever, uh, decades old. You could argue that every cell in their body is several decades old, except that most of the genetic material, or at least most of the cell material, came from your mother, half of the genetic material from your father. Um, so if you track that back another generation, you'd have to say that you were several decades plus however old your mother and or father were. But the same thing can be carried back all the way back. In some sense, everybody listening to this broadcast is about four and a half billion years old. And for some reason, the germ cell line that resulted in you did not show age-related changes, and yet most of your somatic cells do. So to talk about aging, really what you have to talk about is not what causes aging, but why does it happen sometimes and not other times? Why does it happen in some cells and not other cells? Uh, so the implication is that aging is not universal and that it may be amenable to a therapeutic intervention, which is where we're aiming. And so this therapeutic intervention may be a, a drug or something that increases someone's telomerase. Well, that increases the length of telomeres, and I have to say that telomeres per se don't matter. What we're trying to do is reset the pattern of gene expression to that typical of a younger cell, so it acts like a functional young, young normal cell. Um, so telomerase is one way to do that. You could use telomerase, which is an enzyme, to re-lengthen the telomere, but the important part is to reset the pattern of gene expression. And what are some of the age-related diseases that um, telomerase or just re-lengthening telomeres could potentially prevent or even treat? 
Well, some of them are oddballs, and some of them are things that we're all used to. The oddballs are things like progeria. Uh, these are the diseases where you have a five-year-old who looks essentially like a 70-year-old. I used to gather all of them together once a year, and we typically have two or three dozen in any given year. Um, but most people are much more aware of age-related diseases, uh, and the most common ones are things like vascular diseases, that is, strokes, heart attacks, peripheral vascular disease, congestive heart failure, aneurysms. These are aging blood vessels, uh, with heart attacks being where most people think of this. Um, the second major category, though, really, is central nervous system problems. And there you're looking at Alzheimer's, which is the big one, as well as all the other dementias, including Parkinson's dementia. But there are others, for example, osteoarthritis in the joints, osteoporosis in the bones, skin aging, which we're all used to, wrinkles, for example, immune changes, changes in the, in the kidneys, renal function. So it's pretty universal. Most people, if they don't die of infectious disease or violent death, tend to die of an age-related disease, and the most common one is the vascular one um, in most places, not always. In the last year, in the UK, for example, Alzheimer's has been a leading candidate for, for cause of death. And so to really target these age-related diseases, there's certain cells, really, for each age-related disease um, that you're looking at really targeting. That's true. And I sometimes divide this into direct and indirect. For example, if I'm looking at your joints, what I'm looking at are the cells called chondrocytes. These are the cells that, if, if, you know, if you're eating a chicken and you see the drumstick, what you find is this glistening surface in the joint. Those are chondrocytes and the proteins they create. Um, those cells show age-related changes, and those are the changes that result in osteoarthritis. On the other hand, if you're looking, for example, at heart disease, if I end up with a heart attack, it's not the heart muscle that caused the problem, it's the blood vessel, in this case the coronary artery, and you look more closely and you find that the cells that line the vessel, the endothelial cells, show age-related changes that are the cause, in some sense, of heart attack. Uh, the same is true in the brain. It's not the neurons that are a problem. The neurons are sort of the innocent bystander. It's the glial cells and the vascular cells that cause uh, dementias in us. So that's an indirect cause. You know, again, in the heart and the brain, you see indirect aging from cells that are innocent bystanders, you know, causing having problems, but they're caused by other cells. Whereas in things like the bones and the joints, it's a direct kind of aging. So sometimes you can have those supporting cells that are kind of showing the wear of age, and other times it's the actual cells that are kind of directly involved with the age-related disease. That's right. Uh, you know, just to give you another example of this, if I'm looking at heart disease, most people think of heart disease as having something to do with cholesterol accumulation. But it's not the heart muscle that accumulates cholesterol, it's the vessel. It's the heart muscle that pays the price. If you have a heart attack, it's because you have dying heart muscle. But it's the vessel that's the cause of the problem. Whether you're looking at it in terms of cholesterol or in terms of cell aging, the cause of the problem is the vessel, not the heart, not the muscle itself. Same in the brain. And so by kind of re-lengthening um, telomeres on these certain types of cells, we can really be potentially preventing these age-related diseases from occurring if all our cells are all a little bit younger and healthier. That's the magic word, potentially. You know, that's what I first brought up in the General American Medical Association 20 years ago last year. Um, but what we know is that this works in certain cases. For example, we have now known for 18 years, that, or 19 years now, that we could do this in human cells. That if you, if you take older human cells, you can reset the pattern of gene expression using a telomere, and you get what look like functional young human cells. Um, now, as of 18 years ago, we first did this in human tissue. And you can find that you can, for example, take old skin, and grow young human skin from it, or take old uh, coronary artery tissue and grow young coronary artery tissue, or old bone tissue and grow young bone tissue in the lab. The question is, can we do this to human patients? That's a difficult task. Um, it's only been in the last five years that we've really had the, the technical tools to be able to take this to human trial based on the animal studies. So that's where we're bound next, is to see if we can actually prevent and cure age-related diseases rather than, as it were, treating them with band-aids. And it's a, a very exciting kind of idea of going into this and saying that, you know, you've, you've been part of research that has really shown that this is possible. It, it almost certainly is possible. Again, we have to see what we can do, but we're pretty confident that we can do a lot better than anything else that's going on. You know, right now, if I look at, for example, Alzheimer's, there have been more than 400 registered trials um, registered clinical trials all have failed. Uh, there are now 
uh, five or six, depending on which way you count it, commercially available drugs on the global market that are accepted as treatment for Alzheimer's, but none of them have ever been shown to affect the clinical course of Alzheimer's. They may treat the symptoms, for example, of being upset, depressed, anxious. They may treat symptoms, but not the disease. Um, I think we can do a lot better. The same is true when you think about it with things like osteoarthritis. We don't treat an osteoarthritic knee. What we do is remove the joint and put a new one in, an artificial joint. But what if we could actually tell the joint to regrow a normal joint? That's a different, different sort of perspective. And with this, not only looking at age-related diseases, but also cancer, that um, by re-lengthening telomeres, we could potentially, again, we keep using that word, but we may be able to prevent cancer in that way. How would this work? Well, that's an interesting thing. You should raise it because, you know, there's been a lot of dispute about that over the past two decades. The original and very simplistic thinking was that you sort of had a choice. You could either, you could either have an age-related disease or you could have cancer. And if you, if you lengthen telomeres, you increase the risk of cancer and you might decrease the age-related diseases, but you had one or the other. But in actuality, it's far more complicated than that. What you find is that if you have very, very short telomeres, you have an increased risk of, of, of uh, mutation, increased risk of carcinogenesis because you're not repairing DNA as well. On the other hand, the cells aren't willing to divide when they have short enough telomeres. So you may have a, a sense of cancerous cell, but you don't have a clinical cancer because it's just one cell and it refuses to divide. Now, many cancer cells find a way around that. And so they manage to maintain just sufficiently long telomeres they can divide, but not sufficiently long to repair DNA. But what you find is that if you extend DNA sufficiently, you reinstitute good DNA repair and so you're probably going to be able to use this to prevent cancer, and in some cases even to treat it. So it's complicated. It's not a matter of long telomeres or short telomeres being good. It's a matter of just how long or just how short they are. So it really gets down to if it's too long, then it can be bad, but also if it's too short, it can be bad. It's finding that middle ground. Well, actually, I'd put it the other way around. I'd say if it's very long, then you have good DNA repair, so you're not worried about cell division. If it's very short, you have terrible DNA repair, but the cell won't divide, so it's not a problem. It's when it's just a little bit long enough to divide, but not long enough to repair DNA that you end up with cancer. Okay, that makes sense. So what are some of the misconceptions that the public and even the scientific community has that you kind of picked up on over the years that you kind of want to clear the air of? Well, the first one is not a scientific misconception, but a very popular one. I, see this on um, a number of TV or radio shows, and that is the idea that telomeres keep your cells from unraveling, or keep the chromosomes from unraveling. Uh, usually people will compare this to a little plastic aglet on the end of your shoelace. The idea is if you lose the plastic piece in the end, then the shoelace unravels. Well, it just doesn't happen. The chromosomes don't unravel. It's basically just that you stop having cell divisions and gene expression changes. So still, I, I understand the analogy. It just not ha doesn't have to be accurate. The much more common one that worries me, though, is the one I see in scientific circles all the time, and that is the idea that uh, it has that aging in cells has to do with telomere length. It's not length; it's change in length. So, for example, <clears throat> there are varieties of mice that have telomeres that are literally ten times longer than mine, and that they have lifespans that are literally forty times as short as mine. Okay, so people would say, "Well, <clears throat> how can that be? They've got long telomeres, but they have short lifespans." It's not the length of the telomere, it's the change in gene expression, and that's related to the change in length in telomeres. So I suppose you could say it doesn't matter how long your telomeres are, the question is how much have they changed over time? And the real question is how much have they changed gene expression? So this idea that telomere length per se either does or doesn't cause aging is just, it's again simplistic. It's more complicated than that. It's the change in length and the change in gene expression. Um, the other thing I see all the time and this I see an article come out in the literature about once a week. Somebody will say, well, you know, I've measured telomere length from a patient, and it is or isn't related to something I did or something in their genes. But what they're measuring is only the telomeres in my white cells in the bloodstream. Well, almost nobody, not nobody, but almost nobody dies of old white, cell blood, white blood cells. What they die is as a result of old coronary arteries or changes in the brain, uh, glial cells. They usually die of other things. I don't mean it's good to have old white blood cells, but they're only measuring one little teeny piece of the body, and it's a part that's in rapid turnover. It's not a very reliable part. For example, if I stress you, if you lose your job, uh, you, you lose your lover, your dog dies, you 
uh, get a bad viral infection, everything goes to hell in your life. I'm going to find you have very short telomeres peripherally because they're turning over so fast. Now, that doesn't mean that you have old white blood cells in the stem cells in your marrow. It just means you've been under a lot of stress recently. If I remove that stress and I take you back in six months and I look again at telomeres in your white blood cells, it may look like you're younger suddenly. No, you're not younger. They're just not churning as fast peripherally. So that kind of, that's sort of a, an esoteric technical issue. And yet I see it all the time in the literature. People are measuring peripheral white cells and making grandiose statements that may be true, but they're not supported by the data. And so by looking at that, they're really not looking, it's not an accurate picture of kind of the whole picture. It's looking at such a small part of the body that really doesn't represent the rest of it. Uh, yeah, it would be like saying, um, let's see, you have gray hair and therefore you've got heart disease. No, people with gray hair are more likely to have heart disease because they're older, but there's no direct relationship there. That's a different system. I can't go measuring how much heart disease you have or haven't on the basis of your, your gray hair. I should be looking at your coronary arteries. The same thing is true here. If all I'm doing is measuring your white cells, that's interesting. It's not wrong, but people shouldn't jump to conclusions about what it means in some other system altogether. Example, um, I know a study that looked at uh, liver cancer, and they were looking at purple white cells, measuring purple white cells and making statements about the length of telomeres in the liver cancer. No, they may be related, but you haven't proven that in any way. You haven't even commented on it. No, it's just we over, overextend the data. I have a question for you in terms of aging and family history. In, in my family particularly, a lot of my relatives have lived late into their 90s. So I'm wondering if someone like me that has a family history of longevity, if they are more likely to themselves live long compared to people that don't have that family history. Yes, and it may or may not have anything to do with telomeres, of course. It may just be that you have genes that keep down your cholesterol level or your blood pressure and so on and so on. Or you're, you have two ApoE2 alleles, so you're less likely to get Alzheimer's than the person standing next to you. Um, so it's complicated. However, um, it is true that you know the, the older your, your parents and grandparents and so on have lived, the longer you're likely to live for any number of reasons I just, just alluded to, perhaps telomeres are related too, particularly your mother's, your mother's, mother's uh, health. But... It's also interesting that the older your father is, the longer the telomeres tend to be at birth. And I think I understand this from an evolutionary perspective, but there are all sorts of these odd little findings. Um, what you said overall is true, though. You know, the, if you really want to live a long life, pick your parents wisely. <laughs> that it's not necessarily, a lot of people are like, um, that I hear, they say, oh, you must have genes for, for longevity or something. And it's, it's not quite accurate to, to say that. I agree with you, Kara. Um, it's, it's, it's just not that simple. There, there are genes that cause early, early disease and that protect you, but it's not as simple as just you have a gene for long life and a gene for short life or a gene for long telomere and a gene for short telomere. It's complicated. There's a lot, a lot that goes into it, just like, like height or something. There's a lot of um, different oh, yeah. genes and alleles and mutations that are all kind of contributing to that one uh, feature in someone. I agree. Absolutely true. In fact, sometimes people say, how can I be sure I'll live a long lifetime? You know, what can I do? And my answer is fasten your seatbelt. It doesn't have a lot to do with your genes, but it sure can contribute to a long lifespan. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, it, it, we shouldn't focus so much on what you eat or what your genes are. It's all those things. It's a million things that play a role. How much do we really know about aging and, and telomerase in terms of the recent research? We've mentioned kind of a few things of over the past, you know, uh, two decades or so. But is there anything that's been groundbreaking in the last couple years? Yeah, there has been. Um, I can think of a lot of things that have contributed to this. Uh, the biggest problem we have is that people really don't understand the concept. They still think of aging as, as wear and tear. And it's not wear and tear, it's wear and tear versus maintenance. But once they get past that concept, which is hard for people to do, uh, whether it's dealing with Alzheimer's, wrinkles, or heart disease, once they get past that and you're dealing with this issue of telomerase and telomeres and gene expression, there are a couple of key papers. One of them probably is a paper that came out of Harvard originally with Ron DePino's group before I moved to Texas. And what he did is something I can't do to human patients. He bred a colony of mice, essentially, where he could turn telomerase on and off with a switch. Um, that would be like me saying, Kira, I can't do anything for your age-related disease, but I can help your great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren if you'll let me do something to your ova and likewise the sperm of everybody who, who you end up having babies with. 
well, that's not much of a help. Thank you. Um, on the other hand, um, and the remarkable result, though, was that you found that he could take older animals and show that they not only regrew brain tissue, which is interesting, uh, but had a number of other features that were important. For example, increased behavioral function, um, as well as other measures of, of, of disease elsewhere in the body, outside the brain. But another piece that was done was a piece by a collaborator of ours called Maria, uh, Maria Blasco at CNIO in Madrid. It's one of the world's preeminent cancer institutes. And what Maria and her group did was they put a standard telomerase gene for a mouse into a viral vector to hold it, sort of like slipping a letter in an envelope addressed to, in this case, the cells they wanted. And what they found was that they could take mice and improve their overall health, improve their lifespan, and improve their behavioral functioning. So these mice were much more able to, for example, learn, demonstrate memory, uh, <clears throat> um, get across rotating rods or tight ropes than were older, older mice who had the same age but weren't treated. And the implications for us is that we can use that same sort of approach to treat human, human diseases like dementias. Uh, again, this is something we've been predicting for 20 years, but now we have the tools to do it, which is what's critical. And is any of this research involving CRISPR? Because CRISPR's really been very hot buzzword in kind of even the mainstream um, news and everything. Um, or is it a little too early to be using CRISPR? Well, um, in, in a way, and again, I'll put this simplistically because it's not entirely true, but in a way, CRISPR has nothing to do with it, for what we're talking about. It's, it's sort of like this. Say I've got a symphony orchestra, and it has been playing um, Mozart, and now suddenly it's playing uh, some odd atonal thing, atonal symphony out of the 60s, something odd. And I want to fix it. Well, um, what CRISPR does is goes in and tries to retune the violin and retune the piano and change the oboe out. Okay. What we're saying is the instrument's not the issue. The instrument still works. What we're saying is it's the score. So we should take the John Gage score and replace it with a Mozart score, uh, the original score. Um, so we're dealing with different aspects. If, if the problem with the symphony orchestra is that you have a bad violin, for example, sickle cell anemia or, or um, you know, one of the hemophilias, that kind of thing, then CRISPR might be the way to go because you go ahead and fix the violin. But if the problem is related to aging, age-related diseases, change in gene expression, then you want to change the score, not the violin. Has there been any clinical trials yet that are using telomerase or a, a way of relengthening telomeres? Well, there have been some interesting ones using a telomerase-activating compound, estragenol. And um, these were sort of, uh, I, I like to think of them as semi-formal uh, studies. They were published in peer-reviewed journals. In fact, one I used to edit. And what they did was they looked at people who'd been on these estrogenol compounds for uh, six months or more, and they found a number of indicators that, how to put this, biomarkers that were more, more typical of younger people. So, for example, if I'm looking at, at white cell function, not white cell telomeres or some other measure, but actual functional response to, to, to stimuli, you found that people who'd been on these estrogenol compounds had immune systems that function typically like those of people who were 10 years younger than they were. Uh, that kind of finding is tantalizing. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, our best estimates are that these uh, telomerase activating compounds are probably only about five or 6% as effective as what we need them to be, to be able to do things like reverse Alzheimer's or reverse heart disease. Um, they are tantalizing, they're fascinating. There have been about three or four published studies on these now, and I am very fascinated by them. But it is not true that we took anybody who was 70 years old and turned them back to somebody who was 30 years old. That didn't happen. Still, interesting stuff. And for those that kind of have seen commercials that we all have of different anti-aging um, things, such as skin creams or, or different things like this, is there any scientific validity behind this, or is it kind of just a marketing ploy? My quick answer is it's the latter. It's a marketing ploy. So how can they get away with saying, oh, we've, you know, we've researched this or, you know, they say things that sound very science-y. <laughs> and that's a surprise to you. <laughs> I know. Um, well, you know, I think we're all used to that. It's, this is not new in human history. It's certainly not new in the last hundred years and it's certainly not new in the last 20 years. Um, I, I see about, about once a month, I see something come across my desk where somebody claims they now have a way of curing Alzheimer's, 
and it usually comes from a university. Um, the data doesn't bear up. The clinical studies don't, don't work. Um, we even see this with Big Pharma, for example. It's certainly Eli Lilly was very excited about the initial results a year and a half ago uh, with the solanezumab study. But they were, at best, at best, statistically postponing it by about eight weeks, and after that, the courses were exactly parallel. Uh, the data fell apart, and Eli Lilly gave up in their solanezumab trial. But this is the typical course of almost all of these things when you really pursue them. So people will make claims and sell products, but almost all of these products don't work. Um, maybe a few do. Again, there's interesting suggestions that some of these telomerase activators may work. Um, but no, there's very little that can be done. On the other hand, you can understand why people would want to hear these things. Uh, you know, if I go back, for example, in 1950, if I look at some of the ads in the papers, for compounds that could be used to prevent polio, which is a huge deal in the U.S. back in 1950, there are all sorts of ads uh, claiming that you could do things that would prevent polio. Uh, very common. In fact, there was a best-selling book in 1953 called Diet Conquers Polio, where people were arguing that if you ate the right diet, your children wouldn't get polio. Well, that didn't work, but if I were a parent in 1953, I'd be buying that book too. Why? Because there's nothing else. You know, it wasn't until a year later you began to have commercially available vaccines that do function. I think that's where we are with regard to age-related diseases. If I were somebody with Alzheimer's, I'd be grasping at any, any possible straw, and I can't really, as a human being, blame people for doing that. And in some sense, I can't blame people for selling it. They're selling hope, I suppose you could say. But that doesn't mean it works. It doesn't. And how soon do you expect a product to be on the market that is kind of scientifically valid and that can re-lengthen telomeres and have the effects that we've been talking about? Well, we're ready to go to the FDA, uh, complete our animal toxicity study that's required by the FDA and go to human trials. We could have human um, data within two years and then progressing on from there to global global trials. So that's, that's really soon. That's sooner than I thought you would say. Well, it's not as soon as I'd like. You know, we've, been, uh, we've been working on this for two years. We're still talking to various investors who have made promises. Um, I would like to see it tomorrow. And the tragedy of this is that you know, we probably we probably could have done this five years ago. We certainly could have done it two years ago. We could do it now, but it's still taking a while to get through. Uh, you know, investors, the people who have to actually produce the, the vendors who produce what we need, uh, the FDA committees. Um, there are a lot of things, and these are that's the way life is. I don't have to like it, but I do understand it. And once it is on the market, how long do you think that it could extend human life of preventing these age-related diseases and preventing cancer? I think it was Marcus Aurelius who once said something about, it doesn't matter how long you live, it's the quality of your life, whether it's you know five years or 500 years. And, and I, I have to say I'm a little unconcerned about the length of life, but I'm very concerned about diseases. I used to always say that, you know, I don't actually care what causes aging. I just want to find the single most effective point of intervention in age-related diseases. And it is not another statin and, uh, you know, a, a, a vein replacement. It's more complicated than that. Um, so my concern is to treat these diseases. And I think we can effectively do that. I think we can actually uh, not just slow, for example, Alzheimer's, but stop it and reverse much of it. Um, but we have to demonstrate that. Now, if the, if the side effect of that is that you live a lot longer as well as healthier, so be it. Um, it's hard to estimate what we could do to the human lifespan, so I'll just stick with, let's see if we can extend the human health span, and I think we can. Pretty confident we can do it. Well, it's very exciting research, and I want to thank you for sharing with us today and really giving us a glimpse into um, the potential and, and where we're headed with this. Well, thank you very much, Kara. Nice to talk to you. So for people that are interested in learning more, you can head over to michaelfossil.com. If you want to learn more about the, sh the show or listen to all the episodes, you can go to dnapodcast.com, on Twitter at DNA Podcasts, Instagram at DNA Radio, and all questions can be sent into info at dnapodcast.com. I will forward them on to Dr. Fossil for those that um, you know want to uh, ask a very expert question. So thanks for listening, guys, and join me next week to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA.